Good morning. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, uh, uh, it was wonderful running into Senator Kennedy at French Rose this morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's diligently on the Atkins diet, and, and uh, I, I envied his meal, <laughs> among other things. And it's very nice as well to see Ted Sorensen uh, uh, back at our school. It hasn't been so long ago that uh, you were down here in, a, in an unplanned debate with uh, former Mayor Ed Koch uh, over uh, the virtues of President Bush. Uh, that was a, an unexpected delight to hear that uh, uh, unscheduled debate. Uh, both of you have a, an awful lot of experience in presidential uh, politics, and uh, the purpose of these discussions, uh, uh, say to both of you, is to uh, help people understand the relationship between issues in the Electoral College. Uh, our, uh, voting team, uh, William Bevington and at all. William, uh, do you want to just hold your hand up? Uh, William is the head of the executive director of the, uh, the Parsons Institute of Information Mapping, PIM, which has taken uh, an awful lot of data and, and converted it into a, into a visualization that uh, uh, the audience will be able to see and we won't. That will be behind us. Uh, uh, a visualization that takes a lot of the variables uh, uh, and converts them into things, into, into a presentation that makes it easier for people to see uh, what's uh, likely to happen with the Electoral uh, College in November of this year. Uh, uh, all of us who followed the 2000 race uh, learned uh, in, a, in a very clear way that uh, the most important number when you're running for president is the number 270, because that's the number of electoral votes that you need in order uh, to be uh, president-elect of the United States. Uh, uh, and so we uh, have ignored, actually, the national data, the national polling data, and a focus instead on the state-by-state state, state state data. And the views state-by-state uh, uh, state are decidedly not surprisingly different. The red state, blue state analysis is pretty well known. But what, what we're suggesting here with this model, with, a, with, a, with the PIM electoral uh, uh, voting tool, is that uh, on a state-by-state state, uh, uh, basis, uh, the, the big national issues uh, are enormously important. And the first screen I think that I've got up, oh, that's, uh, that means that you couldn't hear me before and now can. Is that what just happened? Uh, the first uh, 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 screen I, I hope that's up is uh, one that shows, uh, what are we showing here first? Just the United States of America up. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, this is a bit awkward because I can't see it. Or, uh, has anybody got a mirror that they can use? Um, general election. This shows a general election, uh, say, to uh, Senator Kennedy and, and, and Ted Sorensen. This shows a general election uh, without any uh, further uh, action uh, of 304 uh, electoral votes for uh, President Bush and 200 and, help me, 34? 34, 34 electoral votes uh, for uh, John Kerry. And what I'm, I'm going to do, this is a, a straight-out election where we, all factors are considered. Uh, but if you push, what this uh, uh, tool allows you to do is to push on various issues that uh, we have selected. There's obviously others that I'd like to talk about when we uh, get into our discussion. But if you push on the issue, let's say, of uh, what do you have first, terrorism in, in Iraq? If you push on terrorism, what does it go to? And what does it go to when you push uh, character? <laughs> and what does it do when you push health care? And what does it do when you push education? Uh, and push uh, jobs, you have jobs in the economy and Uh, push trade. This will make Senator Kennedy want to take off his UAW button. 296, <laughs> Bush. <laughs> um, uh, what it shows, in other words, is that there's a, there's a, there really is a powerful relationship between the issues and the, and the, and the likely outcome of the Electoral College. And uh, uh, what I've done, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to stop talking. This, I know this is going to shock you, but I am going <laughs> to stop talking at some point here soon. What I'm going to do, just to show the uh, uh, full magnitude of this tool or suggest what this tool can do, 
is uh, first to change a few states that I think are going to go Democratic. I think that John Kerry will win. Uh, so go back to the, just the straight general election one. Uh, uh, put uh, uh, Arkansas, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. What's wrong? You're making a face. You did Arkansas, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, uh, New Hampshire. They, they leave somebody out. What are you at? Yeah. And what this, what this shows is, and, and, and Ted Sorensen and, and was mentioning this earlier, that somebody said to him that uh, a friend of his who's a, who's a Republican said that the Republicans didn't, that, that George Bush didn't win in 2000 because of Florida. He won because of Tennessee, West Virginia, and, and Arkansas. And this clearly shows that. In other words, John Kerry can win the... Uh, 270 electoral votes that he needs without either Ohio or Florida is, will not be obvious to an awful lot of people who are at this stage in the game examining uh, the Electoral College. Uh, the next thing I, I want to do before uh, starting a bit of a conversation here is to uh, show the 1960 race, which this tool allows for educational purposes uh, students of the Electoral College who are trying to understand the Electoral College to go back in time uh, we pulled up, for obvious reasons, the, the 1960 race. Uh, tell me what it shows. What does it show up there, Ted? You, you were there. You, it shows that... Close win. Uh, <laughs> Close win. It shows that if uh, Minnesota and Missouri had gone uh, Republican, and they were very close, uh, I believe we would have lost. Uh, Very close. We had uh, 279, 10, and 243. What, what, what was it? Well, take Missouri out again first. It was 292 to 230, so it was a pretty good win on the, in the Electoral College. Uh, uh, now Mississippi and Alabama were the two that, by the way, that Byrd won, that Harry Byrd won. I don't Is know that, if he won, but he won. He got votes in. Well, it says that, uh, well, it says that he got 15. You're exactly right. It says that he got 15 and there are 19 in Mississippi and Alabama. So it says they got 15 uh, electoral college votes. So Al you say Alabama was split. Uh, well, yeah, Illinois would do it. Illinois would, would alter the election. Yeah, two, uh, Not by itself, it wouldn't. Now do... Uh, what was the one that you put up first, Missouri and Illinois? No, I said Missouri and Minnesota, because my recollection is, although there was a lot of wrangling over Illinois, that had Illinois been switched to Nixon, he still would not have been elected president. Am I right? Is that what you said? No, that's, that's right. If he switched either just Illinois or uh, Missouri by themselves, uh, Nixon would not have won. But you have to switch both those two states. You have to switch both uh, Illinois and Missouri to get to 270. Um, well, let me uh, start off. I mean, uh, Ted, you've been out there a lot with, with, with John, and both of you, both uh, uh, Ted's have been out there uh, in previous times and, 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 uh, and understand how these electoral uh, college uh, votes work and how it works on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, I, I would like to bring an issue that we did not pull uh, up uh, which is the which is the gay marriage issue that's popped up uh, relatively recently? We haven't polled it uh, yet, and I, I must say it sort of reminds me of a for some reason it reminds me of a moment back in 1989, right after the Supreme Court made a decision regarding uh, flag burning, uh, I believe, and uh, uh, saying that the, that burning a flag was a legitimate expression of free speech, and there were a lot of us. Uh, who were making noise like sheep and rushing to condemn the Supreme Court. And Senator Kennedy came up to me it was, we were just before we were leaving for the weekend. He says, you've got to read this opinion. It's not as bad as you think. So uh, and actually, I think you were encouraging me to do a, something irresponsible and go in the tank and, and, and in fact, did you know, read the, uh, uh, the opinion of the Supreme Court and found that the Supreme Court's uh, logic was 
very similar to my own, and uh, then ended up opposing efforts to change the Constitution. And I'm wondering if, it, if, if we're dealing with a similar situation here. First of all, uh, uh, talk to me about how, how an, uh, an, uh, an issue like that, that's not on anybody's uh, agenda 90 days ago, even 60 days ago, people were not talking about it as a very important uh, campaign issue, and suddenly the President's leading with a proposal to amend the Constitution uh, to ban uh, both gay marriage and uh, civil unions, as I understand it. Uh, talk to me about uh, either one of the uh, of you about how uh, uh, this happened, how the impact, uh, how it's likely to impact the election, uh, and what you would do if you were John Kerry and trying to deal with it. Well, or anything else that you want to talk about, you can you can tell me how you the, uh, you can tell the folks how you got well, that lighthouse up and. It's a good story. <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, first of all, uh, thank uh, Bob very much for including me uh, in uh, this morning. I think, as we all know, we have uh, one day go before the uh, super uh, primary. And uh, to be here instead of out uh, uh, campaigning for my colleague and, and friend, uh, it's only because John Kerry's very, uh, had one of his best and finest supporters on my right here with Bob Kerry, and because of his great respect uh, for uh, the new school, and because I've been to uh, Syracuse, Albany, and Rochester in the last 36 <laughs> hours, and he let me come by. In any event, I welcome uh, the chance of uh, being here. I think uh, no one comes to this uh, school without having enormous admiration and respect for uh, what it uh, means in terms of uh, education as someone who's on the education committee, particularly looking at the, where we're going in the areas of higher education and no uh, what uh, the new school has represented for so many uh, young people and the process of continuing education, creative thinking, also in the creative arts. Uh, this is really one of the great jewels uh, of our total educational system. I have a great admiration and respect for all of those who have done so much to bring it to where it is and also uh, many, many friends who are part of the continuing process and support and trustees and, and strong uh, supporters. And uh, for me, this is always a very interesting fit because uh, for all of us in the United States Senate, and I can say this uh, Republican and Democrat uh, alike, all of us uh, thought that uh, Bob Kerry was really one of the really creative thinkers uh, in the United States. The Senate looked at old problems, old issues, old questions, and uh, tackled them anew and tried to put together new alliances, new ways of thinking about these, and was willing to take and uh, position and stand on many of the items which are the third rail of, of public policy uh, questions. And so uh, for many of us uh, who knew him in the uh, Senate, also were aware of the traditions of uh, this school, uh, saw this as a very knit, uh, uh, neat uh, kind of a, a, a connection. And I know from my own conversations how challenged he is, how committed he is, and what a great job uh, he is uh, doing uh, here at the, uh, at the new school. So uh, congratulations. Uh, Bob, and thank you for all of your doing. Thank the new school for all it is doing. There's continuing education programs for, uh, uh, for individuals, young and old alike, is uh, one of the great lessons that we all have to learn in terms of our education system and what you're doing in terms of creative and critical thinking about new issues and problems is something we have to get back to. Uh, all we have to do is look at yesterday's uh, debate uh, here in New York and uh, uh, listen to uh, almost the questions by the question is everybody was interested in a simple easy answer yes no yes no yes no the, even the uh, all of the candidates were battling for a little additional time and I was mindful of those uh, great uh, words of H.L. Mencken that said for every complicated problem there's a simple easy answer and it's wrong and uh, if there's something that we find uh, today in uh, terms of domestic and foreign policy you know, the, we were having simple, easy answers, and they're usually associated uh, with the words God as well, since uh, Bob brought that uh, issue uh, up. So uh, thank you for all you do here uh, at, uh, at, at, at the new uh, school. Bob, various uh, references to my uh, button as a, as a long time a supporter, as Ted Sorensen would remember the UAW was one of the first supporters for President Kennedy. We still have loyalty as a very powerful quality in terms of the uh, political uh, life of, of uh, uh, the, uh, certainly my family and also in, in uh, politics. And I know the concerns that so many have who are worried about uh, job security, which is a universal kind of issue, worried about the problems of health care. 
uh, worry about other kinds of uh, issues, and uh, uh, the, um, I can understand the uh, sympathy that has been expressed, and I know they had the uh, votes uh, yesterday. It looks positive for their uh, outcome, and I certainly hope that will be the case. Let me uh, maybe just move back uh, for uh, a moment or two and at least give you uh, my own kind of perception about um, uh, Senator Kerry and then maybe get into greater detail about these kinds of uh, issues that, that uh, I think Bob has, uh, has brought about. I think there have been a number of uh, factors that uh, really mark the emergence of uh, uh, Senator Kerry over the course of the campaign and that I saw over the development uh, of his candidacy and uh, in the uh, in the states uh, where he uh, he participated in, and I think uh, each of these uh, had a rather dramatic uh, impact in terms of him as a as a candidate, which rarely resulted uh, I found in campaigning with him that in many instances he was giving a similar kind of a speech and in many instances using the same words, but those words had an entirely different connection. Uh, with people, had an entirely different relationship with people, and he had an entirely different relationship with people. And uh, it was interesting, at least for me, because I was with him periodically in the course of the campaign, both campaigning with him and then campaigning with the other members of, uh, of his family. And so you could sort of see the contrast and the change and the, and the difference. And a lot of that, I believe, was first of all because, uh, as Bob Carey knows, as, as uh, I have some appreciation, Ted does, uh, that once you've been through this uh, process, it does change you in a very significant way. It really changes you uh, forever. And the real question and challenge is for good candidates, whether it changes you in such a way that uh, you emerge and emerge uh, to the top, and that's really something that John Kerry has done. Uh, first of all, I think he uh, really spent a great deal of time of listening and internalizing a great many of the anxieties and the anxiousness of people around uh, the, uh, that he met. All of these candidates have been out there and listening. I think uh, he listened uh, to these, uh, this anxiety, the anguish, but also sort of the up uh, uh, side of the hopes and dreams of the candidates, and he internalized this, internalized this in a very significant and important way. And I could see it as, uh, as, as it developed over a period of time. I think that was a factor. But secondly, it was a factor that people got to know John Kerry uh, through his family. Uh, particularly in the states of New Hampshire and also in terms of Iowa. I can tell you in campaigning uh, with the two daughters, Vanessa and Alexandra, uh, both women of extraordinary achievement, accomplishment, very gifted, bright, smart women. Uh, Teresa obviously falls into the category and has gotten the publicity and people have seen that and have been wide stories about it and people have understood and respect uh, both her, her views and also about uh, a person that will be able to have the kind of strong personal relationship that John has with her, and you can never look at those pictures of them to get two together and not understand that that's a very real, solid, positive, uh, interactive uh, kind of relationship. But when you listen to Vanessa Carey, who is a graduate of Yale, the top her class at Harvard Medical School, speak about being in medical school and then in medical school and going the rounds and hearing about people that don't have health insurance, people that can't afford the prescription drugs, uh, the pressure that's upon nurses being overstretched, overworked, uh, how they have to deal and with the efforts to require additional kinds of overtime issues. She talks about the health care crisis uh, in terms that anyone, anybody in public policy uh, would admire and uh, would respect. And when she said, I found that I could no longer continue uh, to be in medical school, I had to come out of the campaign because this is where it's going to go. Then she talks about her sense of idealism and where she got her sense of idealism from these long conversations with her father. There isn't a parent in New Hampshire, there wasn't a parent in Iowa that said, I would hope that my child would talk about me the way that, that Vanessa talked about her father. It was an entirely different kind of sense about it. And Alexandra, in a very, very similar way, uh, talking to also a person that's very involved in the creative arts uh, in California, speaking in the same kind of way. And what, were hap what was happening, if people were looking at Senator Kerry now, they listened to th those words, they watched him as having uh, these two young women having this admiration and respect and this personal identification and motivation uh, with him. And that made an important uh, uh, impact on him. Third, I think it was the Vietnam War. I've known John for 35 years, Bob Kerry's known him uh, that and longer. 
And uh, I've seen him in all kinds of different circumstances. And he never talk about the war. I've seen him in relaxed circumstances, on the beach, on boats. I've been in planes, long hours uh, with him. Uh, and he wouldn't talk about those circumstances. This was always sort of locked up inside. And really through a, an extraordinary set of circumstances, this issue came uh, out in a very, very dramatic and important way. It wasn't just old comrades uh, coming out and supporting him, which some did, who had done so in other campaigns. But that extraordinary story of Jim Rossman, who was a special forces uh, personnel that was knocked off his boat in the Mekong, and then they, he saw the three boats go out, and one turned around to come back and pick him up. He's on an enemy fire. John Kerry wounded, throwing the net over and lifting him out of the water. Uh, I've used that as the symbolic message of this campaign. John Kerry went back because he wasn't going to leave anyone behind. And he's not going to leave anyone behind when he's elected president. He's not going to leave the children behind. As this administration has demonstrated, he's not going to leave workers behind. He's not going to leave people that haven't got health insurance behind. He's not going to leave our elderly people behind. He's not going to leave people behind. Symbolically, I think that is a powerful, powerful message. I think it's true. But what I saw during that period of time is when Jim Rossman told the story for the first time in Des Moines. Uh, this is a retired police officer, Republican, uh, from Oregon, and John was really unprepared for this uh, discussion. You could just hear a pin drop. That message went out there over Iowa. People said, we're going to take another look at uh, this candidate. We're going to take another look at him. I've always thought that Senator Kerry was shy, a rather unusual quality for people that are in political uh, office, although I think it was true about both of my brothers as well. They overcame it in different ways and were able to uh, run through that. But they, nonetheless, I've seen this with John Kerry. Many people have interpreted the standoffishness, uh, the idea that it's somewhat awkward in terms of the approaching people. Haven't seen him as I have seen him with dock workers down in New Bedford or Fall River, people who he's familiar with as having a relationship over a long period of time. But there's a standoffishness. And I think what I saw in the remaining days of Iowa and also in New Hampshire, that they began to understand this sort of shyness, and they understood that this release that I think had took place with John in the course of these primaries because of all of this kind of um, sense of what happened over uh, in uh, Vietnam, uh, it was going to, a lot of that was released. Not all of it, but a lot of that was released, and it, was, it uh, uh, gave him a greater sense of ease in interacting with people and how people reviewed his, viewed his family and how uh, people uh, viewed uh, as well um, his own, uh, own message, I think changed the atmosphere and climate on it, changed the atmosphere and climate. It did certainly with regards to those states, which uh, as I think uh, the men and women in this room would understand are really retail states. You can really meet so many people, obviously, in New Hampshire. As a Bob Carey remembers, I mean, you finish with one group and you get in a car and say, where's the next event? And they say, two minutes from now. And you're in another house and you're doing the same thing. And it's very, very real. And people spend a lot of time. And they did with Iowa. And they formed those impressions. And that has been sort of rolling this uh, process uh, along. So I think he's in a very, very strong uh, position uh, on this. I don't have anything adverse to say about other candidates. I've admired uh, John Edwards worked with him closely uh, in the Senate on the Judiciary Committee, where he's been superb, and also on the uh, Health Committee. But this is the time for John Kerry. Uh, this is the time for John Kerry in terms of national security, defense issues, uh, other kinds of issues of leading this country. Uh, this is uh, really uh, the time. And I think that this is uh, uh, the, the real kinds of uh, a possibility. I think this uh, administration has, uh, just doesn't get it. Uh, I think uh, the American people are tired of slogans when we see these cliches. John Kerry is another liberal from uh, Massachusetts. People just aren't buying it. They want to know where you're at in terms of health. They want to know where you are in terms of education. John Kerry will tell, you to, tell it to you and give it to you in greater detail if you want to hear it. Um, and knows about it and feels about it and speaks about it. Uh, people want to know where we're going on the economy. They know our foreign policy. Uh, is in complete to disarray. They know that they're not getting it in the economy. Every new job in New York is paying 38 percent less than the old job it's replacing. Uh, everyone understands outsourcing is a challenge and we're going to have difficulty in dealing with it, but you've got to start off every single day with the President of the United States that understands that at least this is an issue uh, for an industrial society. And there are things that can be done. We might not be able to do all of them, but there are things uh, that can be done. 
And that message is resonating. It resonates in South Carolina, which has lost more jobs per population uh, than the state of New York. And it resonated in Arizona and New Mexico, where I was, as much as it was resonating in, in uh, Michigan and in other places around. The economy is uh, still uh, the issue. And when the economy uh, is the uh, issue, in spite of what's happening on Wall Street, uh, the Democrats have an extraordinary uh, opportunity to, to, uh, to win this. Final point. Uh, I don't think, uh, in this campaign, we have not seen the real discussion and debate uh, about uh, the state of our uh, judiciary. But I can tell you, as a member of the, that uh, judiciary, uh, I uh, will uh, grant that the president is uh, the president of the United States, but barely. Uh, I'll uh, grant that they've won the House and the, the Senate, but I'll be damned if we are going to yield to permit them uh, to think that they can own uh, the judiciary. And that is what this is all about, my friends. Uh, we have not only seen in the last days with the appointment of Pryor in Alabama uh, that referred to the Supreme Court as nine octogenarians uh, and whose last case was rejected by the Supreme Court nine to nothing when he wanted the capital punishment for a mentally retarded with an IQ of 60. Um, and the list uh, goes on, let it where he is, and women's issues, labor issues, environmental issues, or all the rest. Or putting in uh, Pickering. In Hoff, when President Clinton named an ambassador to Luxembourg, halted every nomination in the United States Senate, every nomination in the United States Senate uh, for a, the, the a period of, uh, of time. These are serious leaders, men and women, that aren't going to give up power easily. And if there's any reason why you are going to get up early and work hard for this Democratic nominee is you're going to keep in mind the fact that the next president of the United States is going to appoint three Supreme Court nominees. That's going to decide every right and liberty. Wherever we go with the Patriot Act, it's going to decide every right and liberty. It's going to decide all of the personal rights and liberties with regards to women. It'll decide the issues with regards to uh, gay rights and uh, marriage, um, as well as uh, a hundred other uh, different issues. So this isn't... Uh, 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 at a time uh, for easiness. It's a time of urgency. Uh, it's a time of involvement. Uh, it is one of those times uh, where uh, men and women of, 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 uh, of care and concern and that believe uh, in our process and believe in our system have to be restless uh, and uh, have to be uh, worked up. And uh, uh, with that, we'll wait for the first question. Thank you very much. Uh, Honestly, I'd, I've forgotten how much I like hearing you talk. <laughs> uh, there are, uh, I have a lot of friends still in Iowa who tell me that, that you contributed rather significantly to, to John's success as well. And, and uh, uh, I can certainly understand why uh, listening to uh, that presentation. And I do miss hearing you speak. I guess I, for that very brief moment when we had the majority from 1989 to 1995, uh, uh, all of us who were junior members of the Senate got to go up and preside. It looked like we were real big shots, but uh, the real big shots are the ones who were senior enough that they didn't have to go up there and do that. But it really was fun uh, uh, every time you came over to the floor to speak. Uh, but uh, back to the other question, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, Ted uh, Sorensen, I invite you to uh, comment on it as well, because it does seem to me there's been a huge change in the value and importance of religion. Uh, from 1960 to 2004, and as I look at the, the states that, that I put on my list that that are are going to be determinative of whether or not John can, Kerry can get 270 electoral votes, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Arkansas, uh, uh, I've campaigned in all those states uh, and have a sense that uh, a constitutional amendment on gay marriage could work to the advantage of the president in those states, uh, and I, uh, I, I know that you've visited those states a fair amount as well. And I'm just curious, do you think it's going to be the sort of issue that's going to override, or do you think it's going to be uh, like, like the Times reported over the weekend, where even evangelical Christians are saying, this is not an important issue for us. Uh, our leadership is saying that it's important, but it's, uh, we're more concerned about uh, uh, other issues and more concerned about other questions that we have for the candidates. But, but again, you uh, 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 have been out there campaigning. Uh, uh, how would you like to go out and campaign on a gay marriage in Missouri, 
uh, central Pennsylvania, Arkansas, New Mexico, New Hampshire. Do you think uh, that we can that that John Kerry can can hold uh, against uh, President Bush on that issue? Well, uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, let me tell you what uh, my position is, which is that uh, I support the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court. I fought against uh, discrimination all the time that I've been in the United States Senate. Uh, will continue to do so and I support the, uh, the Massachusetts uh, court. Uh, nothing in the court opinion requires any church uh, to perform sacramental marriage. It does not require the Catholic Church to perform Protestant synagogues uh, or the Muslims to require that issue. That's a confused issue among many of the people. It is in my own state and I imagine it is in other places around uh, the uh, uh, around the uh, the country, uh, so um, I think what uh, uh, is the shameful aspect of this debate is the president of the United States uh, advancing and supporting, uh, supporting, uh, not because uh, he has, as Ted Sorensen mentioned earlier, not uh, an independent role in terms of the constitutional process, a. Uh, a constitutional amendment that will ban not only gay marriage but also civil uh, unions, uh, the way it's been uh, interpreted. Uh, this will be with the uh, outside of, uh, we've had the Bill of Rights, 18 amendments, one of them prohibition, if you eliminate the prohibition. This will be the first time in the history uh, of our Constitution that we will have uh, advanced bigotry and discrimination in the Constitution of the United States. And I personally don't believe in the final sunlight of this uh, debate and discussion that uh, this country is going to do it. I may be wrong, but I don't think it's going to, uh, going to do it. So uh, on the issue about what is the, you know, the cutting issues in, in, these, uh, in, in states, uh, my own sense of people are going to inquire of the candidates, which they have as they did yesterday and that they did in California. They will in these uh, uh, forums. People will have an understanding and awareness uh, of it. I think, uh, as, as we all know, uh, the, uh, at least what I have seen in my campaign, uh, these, uh, the first order of issues have been on the focus on the economy. I know in the framework that you put up here, it didn't have quite the bite in terms of the blues and the reds that some of the other. But I find it is the health care, it is the education, it is uh, the economic uh, issues. It's uh, the failure uh, uh, of this administration being willing to uh, support. We've been seven years since we haven't had an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, so the minimum wage now is at the lowest purchasing power that it's ever been at, 515 uh, now. You've got 7 million people at the minimum wage. Uh, the majority of those people are women, the majority of the women have children, so it's a women's issue, it's a children's issue. Majority of the people that receive it are men and women of color, so it's a civil rights issue. And most of all, it's a fairness issue. The people, Americans believe, if you work 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, you shouldn't live in poverty. Um, people, you, you give that to a hall of people, and they are not, and they understand it. The fact that uh, we have an administration cutting off unemployment compensation, 90,000 a week are losing it. You're 140,000 in New York State over the period of these next four months. 140,000 of them. And we lost that uh, by two votes. Five Republicans voted on it three days ago in the Senate. Unemployment compensation when the fund has $15 billion in surplus. Uh, this would be $5.6 billion and Republicans are united in opposition to it. Give that to people. You take the fact that this administration continues to want to battle overtime affects 8 million people. The people primarily will be affected uh, will be firefighters, policemen, and nurses. They're the ones that fall into the categories. And they've added to eliminate over time something really unique this time. That is, if you have received training in the military, for example, in the National Guard, we have close to uh, about 45 percent of the combat arms now in Iraq are the, are the National Guard, of reserves. So they get training. Um, and then go over to uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, then come back, and because of this training makes them ineligible uh, for overtime. Imagine writing that in. Now, for most people, uh, you give them that, those, let alone 
what the tax code does and outsourcing and the rest of some of these matters, um, people react to those kinds of uh, unfairness, inequity, because this thing isn't just right. People aren't being treated fairly, and they are so committed, even on the overtime. We have defeated it in the House, defeated it in the Senate. They wrapped it in the o omnibus, and that thing is going to come right back about it. Um, and uh, we're not going to let them off the ground on these issues. I personally believe the economic issues override uh, what you call the cultural issues, whether it's in this uh, the gay marriage, whether it's guns, whether uh, church, state, uh, you know, prayer in school, other kinds of issues are all volatile. And Lord and Bob and I, we've debated them and taken stands on all of them. And uh, uh, but um, it does seem to me that that uh, this uh, there. Listen to this. There are 48 out of the 50 states, the new jobs are paid an average 22 percent less every new job. The only two states, for some reason, are Nebraska and uh, and Nevada. I can't explain it. Uh, Bob I can't. Got out of the Senate. Uh, things got make, better. Things got better. <laughs> but um, these are the 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 failure of this administration to level. Uh, just this past week, you saw the CBO said that the president of the United States. Uh, representation that the uh, budget was going to be cut in half in the next year. The CBO says it's absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. Five days ago, he signed, said they were going to create 2.6 million jobs. He said he doesn't agree with that any longer. We had Alan Greenspan say that the, uh, the Social Security is going in the tank, the other kinds of, I mean, uh, uh, we do not want to win, uh, uh, for, for those of the Democrats that are here, we do not want to win on the basis of the failures of the other par party. I, President Kennedy felt very, very strong. You want to win because of the positive feeling of what you're going to do for the people here and what this country is going to represent in terms of our security and foreign policy uh, abroad. And, uh, but I'll tell you, they, they just, uh, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're not the, uh, the smartest uh, people. They're somewhat overrated in terms of uh, the political skills. <coughs> Ted Sorensen, I've got to give you a chance to jump in here because I, <clears throat> I do. I am struck by the, by the tremendous change. I mean, I, I, I remember the 1960 campaign very well and remember how religion, you, I was 17, and our religion was a, was a big issue in that campaign. And you, you cited a, a, a something in the, in the, before we came in here, and perhaps you'd uh, want to tell uh, this audience what was the single most important reason that people did not vote for John Kennedy in 1960. Well, thanks, uh, Bob. Let me say several things. I better say them now, otherwise it doesn't look like I'll have a chance to speak again. <laughs> <laughs> that was directed at you, Bob, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> the, uh, first, I should also say I feel very much at home here. I uh, first met Ted Kennedy over 50 years, just over 50 years ago. And I've been a friend and admirer of his ever since. Now, Bob and I come from the same state. And I might add, this school was founded by a great Nebraskan, Alvin Johnson, who I think my father knew. And so I'm very pleased to be here again. I've been here a few times uh, recently, and I, uh, I think I may be back in uh, May. In any event, uh, I'm. Uh, let me say several things about uh, the electoral uh, map that I understand is up there uh, behind us with respect to both uh, today and uh, 1960. Today, uh, I don't know how your system works. I, I'm impressed uh, that you have it, but uh, some buttons that you ought to include are those that represent the conventional wisdom as to how elections are won. The conventional wisdom is first that party uh, makes all the difference. And uh, the conventional wisdom for a long time is that the Republicans always win. The second button of the conventional wisdom is money. And the conventional wisdom is that the candidate who has the most money always wins. A uh, third uh, button that might fit into that would be family. That was mentioned a little bit by, uh, by Bob, but now we have the, uh, you know, these uh, big uh, 
distinguished families. Uh, George W. Bush uh, is the son of a president who was the son of a senator. Interestingly enough, uh, the uh, grandfather, uh, Bush, uh, was more uh, of a moderate Republican than either his son uh, or his grandson. I knew him quite well. Uh, with John F. Kennedy in my first year working for him, I, when he was senator, we organized something called the New England Senators Conference. And Senator Prescott Bush of Connecticut was a big help uh, uh, to us in that. So family, uh, and the Kennedy family is uh, an example of a family that has been devoted to public service and very successful. And uh, finally, uh, a, uh, according to the conventional wisdom, and you might want to put in a button for this, uh, the vice president, the running mate, uh, makes a difference. And uh, that could affect uh, his state uh, or her state, as the case may be. So you may want to build that into the system. So if you've jotted down uh, these four items, those students who are taking notes, I want you to uh, tear up the notes and throw them away because I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> On all four, the conventional wisdom is wrong. I've been uh, alive for a long time, and this is the 20th presidential election during my lifetime. Interestingly enough, if George W. Bush wins this time, it will be an even 10-10 split. Right now, the Democrats are slightly ahead in those 20 elections. Second, I said that uh, money makes all the difference. Well, it doesn't always decide. And neither does family uh, always decide. And my uh, exhibit number one there is the fact that Nelson Rockefeller never became president of the United States. He came from a very distinguished family. He had all the money he needed to spend for on the presidential campaign, but he was never elected president because uh, no one family can make the difference and no one family has enough money uh, by itself uh, to make the difference. And uh, both candidates in this election are going to raise obscene amounts of money. It's, in my opinion, outrageous how much money is spent and required uh, in a presidential election. And finally, in my opinion, uh, much to the disappointment of the press in the next few weeks, in my opinion, who is vice president makes very little difference. The f uh, we went through this in 1960 where John F. Kennedy was reasonably comfortable that he had the nomination some time ahead of the convention being held and we had to give a lot of thought to a vice presidential selection. We did a little polling, we asked a lot of questions. Let me um, use the, uh, the uh, metaphor of uh, fine wine in a bottle. The presidential nominee, by definition, is the finest wine that the party can produce. If you put into that bottle someone else, you are, by definition, diluting that fine wine somewhat. So the real search is for a, not which vice presidential nominee, what running mate is going to help you the most. The real question is who's going to hurt you the least? Who's going to dilute that fine wine the least? That's who should be uh, uh, the running mate. I hope even more important questions, such as how good a president will he or she be, and will they carry on the president's legacy if something happens to the president, are questions that ought to be considered uh, even more. So on all four of those counts, uh, the conventional wisdom is wrong, and you don't need to change your uh, board at all. In terms of 1960, as Bob mentioned, in a very unfortunate and ugly way, religion played a major role. And it turned out to be the most important issue in the campaign. And John F. Kennedy knew it. 
and he was reluctant to address it. But because our opponent, Richard Nixon, was very skillful, saying in a very uh, objective, nice way that he didn't think religion should be an issue. In fact, he kept saying it in every state of the country. Uh, we knew that uh, it had to be addressed, and finally it was addressed when the Protestant ministers of Houston, Texas, invited both candidates to come before them and uh, discuss the issue. And uh, Nixon, of course, uh, declined. He knew the issue was working all one way for him, and he didn't need to uh, speak about it. And Kennedy decided that was his chance to address the issue in a very comprehensive way, and he did. And that uh, speech answered all the questions and objections raised by those who had legitimate concerns, and I'm willing to acknowledge that uh, some had legitimate concerns, but it did nothing to reduce the wave of bigotry that was sweeping over the country. Not all the bigots were rednecks and Southerners uh, with pitchforks uh, and overalls uh, denouncing uh, the Pope. Some of the bigots were in the North, uh, wearing business suits, some of them even speaking from the pulpits of our finest uh, churches, including the, uh, I think it was the famous uh, Reverend Norman Vincent Peale, who said that uh, he wasn't against a Catholic president, but it would be a different country if we had one. To which Adlai Stevenson, uh, who was supporting Kennedy after the convention, uh, replied that he found the, he thought the gospel according to Paul was appealing, but the gospel according to Peel was appalling. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had said that. Uh, but uh, as try as we might, we even had somebody on the national campaign staff who had formerly been a secretary to the National Council of Churches, a very broad-minded, progressive uh, Protestant. And uh, his, his job was to uh, see what needed to be done and could be done about the religious issue, how to reduce those concerns uh, across the country. But even after all of that, at, when the election was over, a uh, survey by the University of Michigan, which those days uh, was the most respected of all the post-election, exit poll, et cetera, surveyors, found that uh, a tremendous number, not very many Republican Catholics voted for Kennedy, but a tremendous number of Protestant Democrats voted for Nixon. And that the single largest reason for people making up their mind and shifting their vote was Kennedy's religion. He won, and I believe that went a long way to removing uh, anti-Catholicism and religious bigotry in general as a grounds for uh, disqualifying uh, presidential candidates. But perhaps even more important was the fact that during the regrettably short time that he served as president, he did not take instructions from the pope. He did not invite the pope to come over here or to construct a tunnel between uh, the White House and uh, the Vatican. He uh, did not insist on uh, sending uh, public sc funds to parochial schools. He did not appoint an ambassador to the Vatican. He did not turn his back on uh, United Nations efforts to limit population control. In fact, Kennedy was the first president of the United States to support the United Nations uh, efforts uh, on population control, which today uh, the United States uh, is opposing. So in all of those ways, uh, by his conduct of office, 
Kennedy reduced the fears of a Catholic president, and I think that helped pave the way for members of any religion to uh, seek the presidency uh, without that kind of, without encountering that kind of bias. But it truly bugs me today that the heirs of the religious right who raised all of these bigoted uh, accusations against Kennedy are now practicing the very same approach for which they warned the country against Kennedy. They said that if a Catholic president was elected, some clergyman would influence how public officials voted and made decisions the way that clergymen like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell are influencing those decisions now. It's, uh, it's, it's very bad. They said that if Kennedy were elected president, that the wall between church and state would be eroded because the Catholics didn't believe in it. Kennedy made it very clear in his speech in Houston, which I commend to all of you. Teddy White, the great reporter and political uh, scribe, uh, said that the President, President Kennedy's speech in Houston should be required reading for every uh, schoolboy in Boston. I doubt that that's happened. But it is the definitive statement on separation of church and state. And read it now and you will see how badly that wall has been not eroded, but crushed by the current administration with all of its funding for faith-based enterprises of one kind or another, with all of its programs to ch channel funds into parochial schools, with all of its opposition to uh, United Nations uh, population programs uh, uh, and all the rest. So yes, uh, there's been a, a change, uh, Bob, since uh, 1960. Not in the sense of religion being an issue because it was an issue then and it should be an issue now, but it's changed in that the Republican backers on the religious right have done a 180 degree uh, uh, reversal and are now themselves practicing and per persuading this, the current administration to practice all of the breaches in the wall between church and state that they warned the Kennedy, warned the country that Kennedy might uh, practice if he were elected president, but he did not. Did, did either uh, Senator Kennedy or Vice President Nixon ever say, God bless America at the end of one of their speeches? When did that start happening? When did, when, did be, when did it become mandatory for Republicans and Democrats running for president to end their speeches with God bless America? Good question. And, uh, you must remember. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, huh? I think Reagan. 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 Did you do it in 80 when you ran? <laughs> you just don't let up, do you? Do you? I'm <laughs> <laughs> That was a good year. 80 was a good year. I was tell a couple of stories on you. No, I think it, uh, my best recollection was President Reagan, but I don't. Uh, Ted may. Kennedy may have, uh, on at least one occasion, uh, made some reference to uh, God in the conclusion of a speech. But it does seem to me that, the, that today, I mean, I, 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 I know, I have experienced. Uh, uh, not just uh, evangelical fundamentalist uh, Christians, uh, of whom there are many in, in, in my, at least a list of people that I know, uh, but people with very extreme views inside of that larger subset of fundamentalist uh, 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 Christians who uh, uh, s seem to have a, a lot in common. Their, some of their views about the world seem to be a lot in common with uh, people that I've heard speak who are uh, from radical Islam, radical Hindus, uh, radical Jews, in that there seems to be 
uh, on, on the basis of values. They'll cite values at the beginning uh, and then oppose certain things that are going on in the world having to do with a with the modern era, the liberation of women being the being the, the, the almost the, the unifying first thing that's mentioned. Um, you know, the, the, uh, but but also the opposition to uh, other things relating to the modern era. I mean, it seems to me that's where the gay marriage thing comes from. It comes from that that so-called values foundation. I quite agree, by the way, with your analysis of, of the constitutional amendment because I, I do think. What, what needs to occur is a reversal of it to say, is it your value that you should you want something in a constitution that's designed to uh, to extend freedom to all people? You want something in the constitution that explicitly uh, denies people uh, uh, the freedom of opportunity? And I, I do think turning it around grounds it in a value. But it seems that that kind of proposal flows out of this this so, this values movement, this conservative values movement that that I see. Not just with, in Christianity, but also in Islam, uh, uh, amongst Hindus and, and Jews. And do you see that you're nodding here? I mean, you, you want to well, you no, hit that I ball or the, not? Well, I think the uh, uh, no, uh, the one of the uh, uh, Kevin Phillips book on uh, the uh, <coughs> President Bush has a very very interesting chapter about the religion, and also about President Bush about he was the coordinator. Uh, for his father, uh, for the various evangelical groups, and it goes back and gives the uh, the change in the uh, what's happened in terms of sort of the more orthodox religions and how it shifted, to going back really to probably 69, 70, 71, and the expansion from three to about 11 to 12 million uh, uh, with the sort of evangelical churches and their three issues was pornography, uh, per, uh, pornography, pornography, gay rights. Um, and and uh, an abortion; those are their three issues. And how the more traditional religions uh, lost both uh, uh, support and influence generally in terms of the public debate and discussion. They were more interested in uh, they were interested in environment, human rights uh, issues, other types of, uh, of issues which traditional issues have been uh, issues in poverty and other otherwise. Uh, but it has a very, uh, for those that are interested, I, th I thought in, in reading anything recently that, has, that went through it and how uh, this president uh, was the coordinator for that group in his father's campaign and established enormously powerful re relationships. And then it did, does have some discussion about what has happened in terms of the radicalization of political parties in these other countries, which you have mentioned. Um, in uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the the Middle East, um, Asia as as well, it doesn't do as uh, <coughs> detailed history of it, but it certainly sort of has uh, has mentioned that at a time when more of the traditional uh, in in sort of the uh, the, the blue states, the uh, religions having sort of less of a hold in terms of uh, the, the the populations as as, as well. Uh, but the values even connected. What, what was the what was the exchange that? that you had and then I had with Tom DeLay recently refreshed my memory. I've completely forgotten about it. Uh, he attacked you for... Uh, well, the war. But, but I said that he attacked me when I said that this uh, war was a fraud made up in Texas. And uh, he <laughs> differed with me, and thankfully you jumped in. To, no, but, but, it was, uh, <laughs> but, it, but the whole rhetoric... The From someone that uh, never, uh, as you well know, uh, never had the experience to wear the uniform of but but it comes. I, I, the, what, what I find in, the reason I thought of it, uh, Ted, is that he 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 begins his his attack on you with, well, I think, a pseudo value foundation. But it's a va it's a he, he asserts patriotic language. Right. He uses uh, uh, value based uh, rhetoric, uh, uh, and, and then from that he launches an attack. So uh, let me let me turn this around and back into the into the electoral college uh, and the campaign of '04. How do well, How do you see, John? And your and your point to take it oh. to one additional part, and that you is the assault end, on patriotism. Uh, the assault on patriotism that anybody that differed on it, anybody differed on the war, was anti-troops or anti-supporting the Americans on that. I mean, this was the job that they did on uh, Tom Daschle, as you as you remember. I mean, this this oh. they go after Hammer and Tom well, with Max Cleland. Uh, with and Max Cleland. I mean, you, maybe you go. You go on through, you, Bob's. I've heard him on that. It's enormously eloquent and accurate. But that was sort of the, the first example. And then they, they've used this to try and terrorize any kind of potential uh, dissent. And they've got a very well 
organized, very structured. If you look, watched over the, we're, we're off a little bit now, but if you look over the weekend and watch the uh, talking points, I watched Capital Gang for about 15 minutes, John Sununu, write three points on John Kerry, soft on defense, his various votes on soft defense. Dreyer last night was debated, Diane Feinstein, I think on the uh, gay rights uh, issue. He just went right past that, started off with John Kerry on soft of the defense issues. They've all got their talking points, and, and they are all going to continue on that. They have a discipline. They have uh, a, a, a structure. Uh, I think uh, Brock's book uh, that you've read about uh, what has happened with the, how the Republican right uh, you know, has influenced the political dialogue and talks about the meetings that they have weekly, clerks from the Supreme Court, uh, editorial board members from the Wall Street Journal, uh, staffers from Hastert and, and Frist, and they meet every single uh, week down in Washington on this thing and go over their agenda and how they're going to deal with these issues. That's still going on today. No one, every, every one of us sort of know it, but they've been doing it for 10 years. And they've got the Heritage Foundation and these other organizations that spend this money on doing it. And, I mean, we're getting away from the subject, but what's necessary is that for those that have a differing view, we've got to have a discipline and a tough-mindedness, and that's beginning to start with the Podesta groups, uh, organizations, and the rest. But we are dealing with a very tough crowd that's not going to yield power. Well, let me, let me try, try it this way. Let's say that, that John Kerry has this wonderful moment in which he decides that the uh, 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 um, uh, presumption is that he's the nominee, and we're, we're going to find that out. Uh, my guess is as is, is early as uh, tomorrow, latest uh, a week from tomorrow. But let's say he has this wonderful idea that the only way that he can get 270 electoral votes is by putting you and I in charge of delivering Missouri and Pennsylvania. So uh, how, how would you organize a campaign? Well, well, how, how do you talk to, because you know uh, what, what central Pennsylvania is like and what Missouri is like. It is very much uh, a, uh, been, uh, uh, full of communities that consider values to be enormously important. So you walk into, you, you use the word hall, you walk into a hall full of people from Missouri or Pennsylvania, what do we say? Because I always follow your lead, whatever you say, then I end up saying, but what, what do we say to them? Well, uh, listen. Is that a bad the, scenario? No, I bad, but I, I you think it's a I bad idea to put you in charge of Pennsylvania and Missouri? <laughs> Um, the, the, the point, at, uh, at least I found in a lot of different places that I travel for John Kerry, they sort of wanted to know about his heart and soul. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time talking about in different places in the start of this campaign about his heart and soul. I mean, people all know where he is in Medicare and education, health care, and we can do those rallies and all the rest of the kind of part. And that was really intuitive. Uh, basically, uh, uh, my wife said that this has made this suggestion and recommendation, outlined this, and it was really the best thing that at least I did for him, uh, and both, either both when I introduced him or in other places. People want to know. They, they want to know what is it sort of about these people. I think there's some stories to tell in those areas. I mean, there's one thing you're going to do at a rally in Pittsburgh and Philly, and there's going to be something else that you're going to do in the heart of the, the, uh, the state. And... Um, I think at least some of some of that, all of which is very real, and there's a story to tell, uh, you probably. But I mean, we we could consider that, uh, you know, listen to it and find out uh, probably from people that have been successful politically there, who uh, are strong supporters. It's always useful to sort of listen to them. Maybe they want to ask some questions. Do you want them to ask questions? Maybe they'd like to. Anybody out there want to ask questions? <laughs> Fred. Fred, you made, made a point about the you're gonna have to, you, You're going to have to stand up or something. Or <laughs> you made a point that the judiciary was going to be key in this presidential election. I guess two points. One is, was there a realization that as part of the campaign through the House and Senate, you could have been kind of divided the both chambers? And how do you how do you make that an issue that people can vote on in connection? It's not an easy accomplishment in the environment. Well, on the judiciary, uh, for, for, I mean, I think this is sort of <coughs> probably something that will be very powerful in the, in the election. I mean, people are much more conscious about the courts, given the outcomes of the last one. I mean, people wondered sort of why, why is this important. I think most people understand that, and I don't think it's difficult to get that back up uh, in terms of it. Uh, the, the history is, is very, very 
uh, overwhelming about what the founding fathers wanted uh, in terms of the advice and consent. This was the last decision. They voted on it three times to give the Senate of the United States the authority to decide who was going to be uh, on the judiciary. And then the last compromise, well, that it would be a shared power. The idea that we just are going to rubber stamp any recommendation on it is an idea that is sort of in the press, which the right wing continues to say. They are obstructing us. They are obstructing us. The President's recommended, and this person hasn't gone to jail. Why don't you go ahead and approve it? That isn't what the Founding Fathers had uh, in mind. So it's a somewhat education, but people are interested in this. I mean, people are very, very interested. They value this, uh, the courts, and they have seen the courts I think abused, or they hasn't got a lot of attention with regards to Pickering and Pryor, but they've seen this for thoughtful people. You've got some time, which we never had before uh, when the campaigns. You're going you're to have seven months, six months, uh, in terms of a national kind of debate on this. They're going to have to try and choose, I believe, both in terms of the merits of this thing and in terms of the process of it. This is one of the key issues, and this has a big ring in terms of uh, the independence, because people don't understand that the judiciary is to be independent, and they just don't want, uh, even when the, you could say, well, the country's divided, the people were that were going to be recommended were going to be somewhat in the mainstream. And to have a series of ideological uh, right-wing uh, recommendations on this, we're, we've only, you know, we passed 98 percent. I've probably voted against 15, but we've only defeated probably four or five. Um, we got another one coming up now, this Haynes uh, for the Fourth uh, Circuit that we'll have this uh, week, who I'll oppose. I think we'll get five, probably six votes. He is the architect of the whole Guantanamo, uh, the, the uh, magnificent policy we have there about even having Americans who are charged with no rights, no protection, no lawyers, no conversations, no nothing on it. But whether we can get is, you know, whether there's going to be enough kind of uh, velocity to try and get some of these things up to the, this is, we have to be somewhat creative uh, about it. I feel enormously strongly about the judiciary having been in, in, and I, in 1968, when I came back into the campaign, was because of it. When you, you say, well, there's so many liberals sat on home, said, well, uh, you know, Hubert's not against the war enough, so we're not going to get into this thing. And, Christ, we ended up with these uh, people on the Supreme Court that just uh, under, uh, undermined so much what, what was important. So I think for us to try and think of creative ways to get this back on the agenda and get it up is going to be one of the key uh, kind of questions. Sure. Great, thank you. Uh, question for Senator Kennedy. I think you're absolutely right that the issues are uh, all the issues you named and that there is not a huge cultural war here within this country. They may be at large, but not in this country. But I do think there has been a long-standing effort just revived to create a cultural war in this country, to create many cultural wars, the most recent is uh, uh, an extremely troubling, in my view, inflammatory essay by uh, Professor Huntington, who has done this once or twice before, in foreign policy, essentially saying the U.S. is going to become a Hispanic country, spelling it out that this is a major cultural threat, and essentially inviting uh, the entire country to stand up against this threat. It's an open, inflammatory, I dare to say virtually racialized attack, which is calculated to produce fear and calculated to produce a powerful response. He, he's a powerful thinker. He's located in a powerful place. It's an extraordinarily bold, uh, troubling intervention. Of course, it opens up a host of public policy issues, serious ones, immigration, citizenship, voting, language, etc. But uh, the question I want to pose to you and to Bob and to Mr. Sorensen are, uh, how do we take on this kind of effort to create culture wars when we have other very important matters to tackle? Uh, let me simply say that, that it's not new to have attacks in this country against those who come from abroad, who come from other countries. When uh, Senator Kennedy's ancestors came from Ireland, when my mother's parents came from Russia, uh, 
there was lots of gloom and doom that this was going to be the end of uh, the United States. Uh, well, it wasn't the end of the United States, and in time, uh, the Irish and the Jews and others were all uh, assimilated, and this country has gone on to be even stronger and more prosperous uh, and more cultured and civilized uh, because of it. Now there are those on the right once again who are starting to make uh, immigrants the scapegoat for whatever is going wrong in this country. And uh, I don't think that it's going to succeed because this is a nation of immigrants. That was the name of a little book that President Kennedy wrote on the subject. So uh, I don't think Sam Huntington, to the contrary notwithstanding, that uh, the forces of, of uh, know nothingism, which is basically what it's a return to, are going to succeed. Just to, to, to add a point, I, fortunately, I had Sam Huntington in college. Uh, that was <laughs> when I first got a reading on uh, this. As Ted said, we had the Asian Pacific Triangle. You know, we eliminated in, in 1965 on the immigration bill. That restricted all Asians, 123 Asians came in. We had the national origin quota system, which said that you had the allocation uh, so that no Greeks, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italians could come in, or they were less than probably 250 at that time. And that thing was changed. And the, the, bo the point that was changed to is, one, either the reunifications of families, and secondly, to have special skills which would make it possible to further employ uh, others. I mean, those are the tenets that are basically it. And we re narrowed the limitations of families because they were so extended to include sort of the nuclear family in recent times. That's a pretty good, uh, still a pretty good uh, judgment that we had. Basically, what I see is this comes up at times where you have greater economic insecurity. If you don't have the economic insecurity about it, th then it's sort of, sort of the tide goes down and watching this. We can do a lot about illegals, but you have to do something. Uh, the, if you're dealing with legal issues on it, there's a different atmosphere and climate for the uh, uh, debate. But I agree with you. The, uh, uh, this is, the, the president has this program where the, you know, it's a crassus, I don't want to keep getting back at him, but uh, let me just say uh, a, a program which will permit uh, the, legal, uh, the uh, adjustment of status for up to six years. And so you can work here. At the end of that time, you have to go, you have to leave the country. You, the contrary one is to uh, earn your green card, earn citizenship in a period of time either on the accumulative years if you've been, three to four years, probably a year, two years ahead. That's a matter of flexibility uh, on that part. And then secondly, the protection of the workers while they're here. There, there are extraordinary abuses while they're here, even with the, under, the, under, under this. Uh, under the Bush, and Bush saw this thing get enormously positive results among the Hispanic community first put it out. Except when they begin to think about it, they say, look, I'm going to be here legitimate for six years, and then someone's going to have my name, they're going to have my number, they're going to have my social security, they're going to know just where I am, and bingo, out I'm going to be and deported, which is exactly what's going to happen on that. And uh, so it's, it's really a phony kind of a, a process, and it's agitated a lot. And there's a lot of turmoil within the Republican Party, which is uh, just fine, because we know what we are for, the Democrats are for, let them be angst about it because they're never serious about trying to be fair. The statute and then the constitutional um, amendment on it, we still didn't have the kind of turnout. Uh, there are a lot of different answers. Some say if he got better candidates, people will, young people will go out, not a good candidate. So many are absolutely deplored and horrified by the money aspects of it. And uh, I join in that. I'm, I'm very strongly for public financing all across the way. Uh, on it, but you couldn't get 35 votes. We had the votes in the wake of Watergate. We broke a filibuster. We had public financing for the House, public financing for the Senate, public for the presidential, and broke the filibuster. And we got into the, the conference uh, on it, and um, uh, the House didn't want to fund. Uh, you know, the Tip O'Meal said, are you crazy? We've got, you want to fund? Uh, the, all the Democrats in Massachusetts never got uh, they'd all been in there for years, Tip, 25 years, Jimmy Burke, 27 years, Eddie Bull, and 23. You want to fund op opposition for them every single time? And are you out of your mind? I mean, you, so I, we said, we'll take it just for the Senate. No, no, no. You didn't take it for the Senate. They'll say, why didn't you take the House? So we ended up, that was the beginning of the public financing in terms of the, uh, for the presidential on it. 
but we ran out on it. And uh, we ought to be, it ought to be public financing. We ought to be accountable to the people in our constituency. We ought to be working back down there. Uh, as when, when Bob was in there, we ought to be working. For, uh, for the first 15 years I was in the Senate, we worked five days uh, a week, 12 months of the year. We never got it. We got Labor Day off and the 4th of July. We're in there all the time. Everybody came back Sunday night. You're lucky if you got home Friday night and you did the people's uh, business on there. Now we, everybody parachutes at Tuesday lunchtime to find out what's going on. They see people all afternoon. They all bitch and complain in the, at the conference about when they're going to get a chance to speak, and they're all out of there Thursday. And the interest all weekend long working those staffs and working. And it is a lousy, stinky system, and young people know about it, and other people do. But it's the best system we've got, and they can't give up on it. And I think uh, that we've got a, a chance to do something um, about it. Um, you know, the interesting thing with young people, as you probably know, it's the highest uh, time for volunteerism. I don't know what you've got here in the, probably the new sc school. You know, a lot of these kids can't, don't have the time. But in, in, uh, up at, uh, at uh, Harvard and their Institute of Politics, 68 percent of them are working 10 hours a week alone in voluntary time. But they won't get into politics on it. So, uh, but they'll do, they'll get involved. And I think a lot of that is that they feel that they can get some satisfaction from dealing with either working with kids or tutoring them or working with other groups or nonprofits and other part, and they don't see the satisfactions in getting, getting it. I think uh, some of that changed this time. You know, that thing was an exciting, this has been an exciting race. A lot of young people got involved in these, in these presidential. People have been up. They've gotten Dean, Edwards, Kerry, and uh, it's been a more exciting time. Hopefully we can try and find. But you put your finger on an excellence. It's well worth having a good conference on that sometime. I'd, I'll say a word on that, uh, Bob. Uh, I don't think you should uh, put too much emphasis on the uh, low turnout figures. Of course, they're a travesty. You make, it makes you wonder, is this a democracy when 50% uh, or less have turned out? The turnout in primaries is even uh, lower than that. But the turnout in some of the foreign countries to which you referred is high, 70, 80, or 90% because in many of those elections, they're deciding between a party of the left and a party of the extreme right. And uh, those countries sometimes swing back and forth between those two extremes, and it makes a tremendous difference. In this country, people have come to the conclusion that it doesn't make that much difference, that there isn't that much difference between the two parties. I don't agree with Ralph Nader that there isn't a dime's worth of difference talking about. It can make a tremendous difference. But uh, frankly, I've been disappointed in my own party. I thought that uh, President Clinton uh, too readily swallowed the advice of, uh, what was his name, Dick Morris, that he should triangulate the issues by getting them off the table, reducing the difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. I'm glad that uh, Senator Kennedy has not been a a part of that trend, that he continues to stand up on the Senate floor and speak out for the traditional democratic values and for those who are least well off at the, uh, at the bottom of the ladder, so that when there is a real choice, I happen to think this year there is a real choice because I happen to think that the incumbent administration is the most dangerous, incompetent irresponsible administration of my lifetime. And that uh, John Kerry, uh, if he is the nominee, will be uh, well qualified and everybody ought to turn out and that ought to get those figures up over 50%. But I would not adopt measures such as, I think it's, uh, where is it, Australia, where they pay people uh, to vote? Uh, go out on the street sometime, uh, as uh, Ted has and Bob has, Go out on the street sometime and uh, talk to people. Uh, how, how are they going to vote in the election? And they'll say, what election? And you'll be glad that they aren't going to the polls because. <laughs> well, Ted, I've got to say, I've been called dangerous, incompetent, and irresponsible, but never all three at the same time. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, yes, go to the back. Uh, 
painfully uh, inadequate. Uh, we had, uh, and we couldn't get the administration uh, to uh, send a Dodsman, and I'd suggest maybe you look at a, his website, goes into very good detail of this, uh, very considerable detail, what they, they tried to do. Um, and they've got some legislation that was passed, some funding, uh, about a ha uh, five, four or five hundred million dollars goes through the estates uh, to try and upgrade uh, the, uh, the systems, uh, to try and also deal with the disability limited English speaking. Um, but there's increasing apprehension about uh, some of the new technologies, um, and uh, particularly since the one person that is the principal contractor for some of these new technologies is the biggest uh, Republican uh, support, a Debolt, uh, one of the Debolts. And uh, there's, uh, I saw, on, I guess it was on NBC about two or three nights ago, where they had some hackers that were able to go through and not only flip it at the local level, but also get into the central kinds of system for some of the systems that have been now accepted by some of the states. So it's, um, we're, we're uh, well behind the curve. One of the real problems, I'm not going to blame this, I, uh, Chris has really done this much, and if you're really interested, write to him or get it on the, on the website, because he has done a lot on it. Um, the, we, they, the difficulty in getting the administration to do anything, or the Republicans to do anything at all on this has been just so incredibly uh, painful in the light of everything. They just don't want to change or shift uh, the, uh, the process and the system. I don't want to be sort of a, uh, a you know, continuing voice about how bad they are, but uh, if you look on through that, uh, Chris's uh, website, for those people interested in it, you'll really see what has happened over the period of the last year and what the problems are with that. It's a still a continuing uh, issue. And uh, the new electronic system that are trying. I guess in some places, states now they're trying some out today. There's kind of a review. I think there's of the 11 states that are out there. I think there's a couple of them that are using some new technologies on it, and everybody's kind of watching that to see what see what comes uh, from it. But there's a lot of a angst about whether they um, uh, whether we we've, we've made some progress or whether we've taken a step back. Yeah, I mean the the problem, of course, is the technology itself tends to allow the development of uh, a, you know, very irrational feelings about election outcomes as a result of not having a paper trail. I mean, but I mean, the Georgia election was the one that uh, Ben Barnes and, and Max yeah. Cleland's losses. But even the chairman of the Democratic Party in Georgia uh, said he did not believe that uh, the losses were attributable to the hacking into the software and so forth. But there is that there, absent a paper, a paper trail, you basically have you know every single one of them is a hanging chad. That's essentially what it amounts to. We had just, when we, Massachusetts went from paper to punch, punch through. They have to punch through. We lost 10 percent because people get confused. They get scared. They got in there. They have a certain amount of time, and then they feel they have to leave there because they don't understand. The, they, they have to punch it through, and it can be explained. And, uh, you know, you've got all of these sort of uh, legitimate sort of concerns, too. People get a paper, and they look at it, and they can understand it and deal with it, but they couldn't, some people, the older people had difficulty being able to adjust. So you've got all of these, and there's a lot of people that aren't computer literate in ter terms of trying to get on through this. So these are legitimate kinds of uh, issues. I guess we can do that. John, did you have to Just in case you think our system's perfect here, wait till you go to the polls tomorrow, and you will find that the names of presidential <laughs> candidates who dropped out are still on the ballot, and some of them have delegates uh, who are running, and some of them don't, and you're going to have trouble identifying where to uh, push the button for a delegate to, for a presidential candidate whom you support, but uh, it shows that we have a long way to go to perfect uh, voting systems. Why we, why we are lecturing uh, the rest of the world on uh, democracy when we don't have our own system perfected uh, beats me. John? I'm concerned about the judiciary. We've been through it. Is that ever a young person's cause? I don't think they're watching that. And I think the way you explain the judiciary, I mean, my gut feeling is they are interested in other things. But the judiciary has been a lifelong problem. Uh, I think should be played by young people to young people. 
Uh, I mean, if Howard Dean had picked up the judiciary as a thing, he might have sold a lot of young people to go and vote. It is singularly the most important issue, in my opinion. That's what he was saying in Des Moines. It just came out as a scream. People <laughs> misinterpreted him. Yes. No, I think, so. John, you're absolutely, uh, you're absolutely right on it. And uh, I think you're absolutely right, and uh, it's important that that be presented in a uh, significant way in the course of the campaign. I just wanted to follow up on the electoral process issue again. There were many things in Florida. People said in some countries people would be in the streets over the stuff that went on there, like people who had felonies but who really had the same name as people who had felonies. This is very unnerving for the people who are following up on this because it seems like not a lot is being done because the Republicans don't want to do a lot, but they could get the election with this stuff, aside from looking, you know, at different... This uh, was never meant to, uh, uh, as much as we tried in the very beginning to have it applied to 2004, could never get an agreement on it. It goes beyond 2004, the money the states, maybe the states are moving or a few states are moving, but the, the base other part was going to be afterwards. I mean, we, everyone wanted it for two, at least the Democrats wanted this for 2004, but it, that part was just not going to be, uh, uh, this thing was going to be perspective. 2006 will be the, uh, the, ne the, the time when any of the uh, <laughs> federal funds and the rest of it can, will, be, uh, will be set up. It's, uh, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, mean, I do have to insert, though, the one thing that, uh, Ted, uh, Senator Kennedy alluded to earlier is that when, when you get right down to the, the last 10 days of the campaign, there will be, and it's a very difficult thing to, 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 to uh, digest because of the implications of it, there will be 7 or 8 percent of the vote still undecided more than that. That, are or more than that, that are going to vote. They're going to go to the polls. They've, 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 they're, there's almost 100 percent certainty they're going to go to the vote, regardless of the weather. They're not going to be confused. The tech, they don't care what the technology is. They are going to vote, and they haven't made their minds up yet. And they will be heavily influenced by the last 30-second ad they watch on television or the last piece of mail that comes in the mailbox. Uh, yes? Is that? No, I, th I think, uh, the, I think I mean, that's absolutely right. I think one of I mean, the other. Called, they're, they're called undecided, but they're really monstrously uninformed. To, to be undecided that late in the campaign, not being able to tell the difference between, I can't decide who I'm going to vote for. It's going to be George Bush or John Kerry or George Bush or Al Gore. And it, it terrifies the, the candidate because they're sitting there knowing that almost any statement at all can get misinterpreted and turned into a 30-second ad, especially when you're running against somebody, won't be 10 days out, he'll be using public money. But over the next, what is it, six months uh, through the convention, five and a half months through the convention, there'll be a substantial amount of television buy that'll take every one of the votes that, uh, that John Kerry has cast and try to get at that undecided voter in a hurry. Uh, and it, it, it puts a premium on the dollars that are, be, that, that are available to the candidate to spend. You know, um, in the last, it, it's not only this problem, but it's the misinformation that you're familiar with. And last uh, election, my, my niece was up in, uh, in Maryland. They, they put out, they flooded all of uh, Baltimore with these pamphlets. Uh, uh, make sure you vote on, on Monday. They give the wrong date. But uh, you can't vote on Monday uh, if you haven't paid up uh, all of your, uh, for your automobile and your child care. Don't bother coming to vote on Monday. So you have all of this kind of confusion that's going on in leafleting our community. So they, they're confused in the time, the date, they wonder what it's, this is going to be on. And that, that stuff goes on. That, that's happening, and that's going to uh, happen. Uh, and uh, we, we, I mean, besides all the other problems we've got, that, that's, uh, that, that's real. And it's outrageous that the Justice Department doesn't, uh, uh, we don't have set up, you know, systems to be able to deal with all of these things. Hopefully we'll try and get that done, you know, by the time of the fall. But that's, that's still happening in, in America. It's kind of just uh, disbelief. Well, I, 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 I know there's lots of other questions. I promised Senator Kennedy I'd have him out of here at 11, so I've, one more time, I've broken a promise I gave That's to you. I hope, you, you, I hope you'll come back again. Thank you very much, Ted Sorensen, as well, uh, for coming. Thank you very much. Good. Ted, good to be with you, my friend. Glad to see you. Ted, Ted. Ted, Ted. 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 Ted.